Hi, I'm Ashley C. Ford, correspondent for Time 100 Talks, and I'm joined by Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms. Welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, Ashley. Nice to talk to you. How are you today? I'm pretty good. Doing all right. Absolutely. Mayor Bottoms, I know that you and your family had your own personal experience with COVID-19 earlier this summer, so I just wanted to check in and ask how everyone's doing and recovering. Compared to so many other folks, Ashley, we're doing great. I had a great conversation with a young man, Justin Hunter, today who lost both his parents to Mm. COVID. So when I look at, at families like Justin's family, I mean, we count our blessings. My husband's still having a lot of the side effects or after effects, rather, that you hear about with COVID, um, headaches, um, joint fatigue, nausea, all these things that we, we don't know what that's all about. But all in all, we're doing great. Good. I'm glad to hear it. After being one of the first states to reopen, you guys down in Georgia have been hit pretty hard by COVID-19 numbers wise. What have you learned about leading people during this time? And not only have we been hit, but it's not getting any better. And that Mm. is the most frustrating part of it. But what I've learned is that you, you do the best that you can do and you do it for the right reasons. And if it works out, that's great. Um, but but if it doesn't go the way that you plan, you got to be able to sleep at night. And um, what I've said all along is that I, I want people to be on the other side of COVID. And even with my dispute with the governor of Georgia, I've said, I hope that he's right and I'm wrong, because if he's wrong, more people will die. And unfortunately, he's wrong, wrong, and continues mm-hmm to be wrong about this. We open up too soon. That's the reality of it. And it's not too late um, for so many families. Uh, you know, it, it, it really is too late, but it's not for us too late as a state to turn this trend around. And I just hope that people will continue to exercise common sense and good judgment and be thoughtful about um, people other than themselves. You know, this is a very hard thing to do right now as a leader, I think, is to try to talk with people and mitigate some of the damage that this virus has spread across the country. So I'm assuming some of your constituents think reopening was too soon, as you do, and some of them probably don't. How are you navigating those conversations with community members and with business owners? Well, I I, I think our best example is New York. New York was hit first. They were hit hardest. And Governor Cuomo made very sound decisions. And New Yorkers made um, very unselfish decisions in terms of closing down, shutting things down, and hunkering down to get to the other side of it. And as New York, um, New Yorkers um, reemerge into day to day life, you're able to think about things like, can the kids go back to school and how businesses reopen and those are the things that get the economy restarted so i certainly understand people's concerns about the economy and and they need to get back to work Uh, but there is something called sacrifice and in the midst of a pandemic it calls on all of us to make sacrifices to tough it out. And again, I know it's easy for me to say as as my refrigerator is full and my lights are on. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to dismiss what people are feeling. But the other part of that is as leaders, that's why we got to make decisions for people so that they can keep their lights on. So they, they can have food in their pantry. Those are the things that we have to do to make it easier for people to stay home right now. What do you think other leaders across the country, or what do you hope other leaders across the country, other mayors, governors, up through the highest level of government are learning from this right now? Like, what do you hope they're getting from it? Leadership is as much uh, about leading as it is following. Mm. So I gave the example of New York. Uh, We had a really good example of a state that got it right. We could have followed the lead of of New York. Um, But you also have an opportunity to lead and to make 
decisions um, on behalf of your constituents. And it's my hope that's what leaders are understanding right now. It, it, it's not always appropriate for you to be the first. Sometimes you need to follow. Um, it, and, and it's not going to always be easy. We're not elected to make easy decisions. We are elected to make tough decisions. And we have to have patience. We have to have empathy. And we also have to know what we don't know. As I make decisions related to COVID, I'm not making them based on what I know about medical science or public health. That's not my area of expertise. But I do have sense enough to listen to the folk uh, who have this area of expertise. And what they're telling me, follow the data and the science and the metrics and make your decisions based on that. Do you think Georgia should shut down again? I think Georgia should roll back. Mm. I definitely think Georgia should roll back. I believe there should be a statewide mask mandate that would go a very long way. I think that it's too soon for schools to reopen at the very least. I think parents and teachers and staff need to have the option of whether or not they will engage in virtual learning or send kids back into the classroom. It's simply too soon. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and and we, we're seeing it already in our state. As schools have reopened, kids are getting infected. And, and it's, in my opinion, and this is my opinion as a parent, it's more disruptive to think you're sending your child into a situation and then have to pull them all back out. And that's what's right. happening in schools throughout the state. Right. Have you sent your children back into school or are they staying home? Thankfully, uh, my kids' school, have the op they will have the option of virtual learning. We are not sending our kids back. I have one who's starting college um, in a couple of weeks. He'll be virtual only. All of my kids will be virtual only um, for the first few weeks of school. Uh, Atlanta Public Schools is going nine weeks virtual only, mm -hmm. and then we'll revisit um, system-wide. If it gets to the point where the state is not willing to assist or actively works against some of those rollbacks that you think we need to see in order to get this virus under control in Georgia um, and in Atlanta, do you have a plan in place for what happens to Atlanta and how you try to protect your constituents even in the midst of that kind of pushback? Well, from an organization standpoint, the city of Atlanta as an organization will not go back to business as usual. And that has been a guiding point for a number of businesses throughout the city. They're looking to our lead. So the, we had an advisory council that made recommendations on how the city should proceed in terms of reopening. We're back at phase one based on data and metrics which also means that many of our large job centers, because the metro area is home to 26 Fortune 500 companies, have not reopened as if there's business, as if it's business as usual. So that's been very helpful. Even the Atlanta University Center in making their decisions looked at where we were with our metrics and recommendations and made decisions accordingly. So we'll continue to do what we can do, even if they are recommendations advisory recommendations. We're going to continue to do the research, continue to talk to the experts, and offer what we think is, is our best advice to constituents um, across the city. And I truly believe if we weren't making those decisions and offering uh, these recommendations to people that our numbers would likely be much worse. Mm. You mentioned personal responsibility and personal sacrifice and being unselfish as some of the reasons why New York, where I am, um, was able to sort of get a lid on this thing after a while and watch this entire city begin to slow the spread. What do you think is fueling this resistance to mask wearing or social distancing or taking precautions at all in the face of COVID-19? It's Donald Trump. Mm. When you have people like Donald Trump and even Governor Brian Kemp pushing back, people look to, to leaders for examples. And when you have the President of the United States saying it's a hoax, people believe that it's a hoax. Um, when, when you 
have governors um, who won't make sound decisions based on science, people who believe in their leadership will also make, not make sound decisions based on science. Um, I, I love, there was a, the, these great t-shirts that somebody printed up. It said, I'm gonna go with Keisha on this one. So mm -hmm. in the same way people are following Donald Trump and, and Brian Kemp, people are looking to me to, to see what my recommendations will be. Um, which again is why I'm not making them based on what I think or, or what I want or what I hope. I'm basing recommendations based on science and data and metrics. So when the ICU beds open up and when the positive rates uh, begin to trend downward and, and all these metrics fall into place, we'll move on to the other phases. And with four kids in my house, I can tell you, nobody wants school reopened <laughs> more than me. <laughs> I can believe that. We we are a whole that. scenario <laughs> right here. I'm a I'm a working parent. Right. Um and it's hard. So we all want to be back to to business as usual, but hoping that it happens and wishing that it happens and, and saying it's happening is not the same as it actually ha it, that that it's actually happening. Right. Based on the science. It's just not happening right now. Right. And, you know, I know that in the midst of, you know, trying to protect the city and trying to save as many lives as possible, that in July, Georgia Governor Brian Kemp sued you over Atlanta's mask mandate. What do you, what do you think is the motivation behind that suit? You know, I, I have no idea. I know I was sued the day after Donald Trump came to Atlanta and I pointed out that he violated our mask ordinance because he didn't have on a mask and he was at Hartsville Jackson Atlanta International Airport. Mm. Um, I, I don't think it was a coincidence. It was the day afterwards. Uh, there were cities all over the state that put in place mask ordinances beginning with my good friend Van Johnson in Savannah. He, he didn't sue any of the other cities. This was, he didn't even sue the city of Atlanta. He sued me personally mm -hmm. and my city council personally. So this is something that was very personal, but I, I don't know. I don't know if it was because of the demographics of the city. I don't know if it's because I'm a woman, if it's because I called out Donald Trump. I, I, have, I have no idea. Uh, it could be all of the above or, or none of the above, but I, it's just, it was odd. Yeah, yeah, I can see. It seems odd, I will say that, from the perspective <laughs> um, outside looking in. It definitely does seem Well, odd. thank you for confirming. Sometimes <laughs> <laughs> we, we think things, but it's always right? better to have it independently verified. It's always better to have somebody just giving you that look, kind of like, yeah, I saw that. Mm -hmm. um, during the pandemic, Atlanta has been a hot spot also for demonstrations against racist systemic violence from the state. You've been praised and criticized for your reactions to those demonstrations, mm -hmm. but how are you continuing to foster those conversations with, with the leaders of these communities and with everyday people in Atlanta who just want something different? Yeah, and you know, very simply put, leading is hard. Everybody's not going to agree with you. I remember one day sitting thinking there were there were two breathing beings on this earth who were pleased with me, and those were the two puppies in the backyard. Mm -hmm. Like everybody, <laughs> my family was upset with me. I mean, everybody was upset with me. Um, but that being said, my mother often reminds me, you only have to tell the truth once. And I've heard people say that we're dealing with these two pandemics at once, this health pandemic and, and this systemic pandemic called racism. And I will always speak my truth and people may disagree with it. And, and when I speak my truth, it's not to, it, it's not to lecture people, um, in, in a sense that I think my thoughts are better than yours. It's, this is my opinion. I'm gonna tell you how I feel about this. Mm -hmm. And what I feel is, is, is what I expressed. We've got some real issues in this city. 
and in this country, and you've seen the frustration and the anger bubble over and boil up in our streets. And until we deal with those underlying issues, they're going to keep boiling over and spilling over into our streets. Mm -hmm. To the extent that we've had any grace in Atlanta, I truly believe it's because we have been doing the work and we were doing the work um, but before we started seeing the movement happening before our eyes this summer. Um, and even our relationships with, with our police officers. We have mm -hmm. at Promise Youth Centers that are staffed by our police officers, volunteer and serve as mentors to kids and really working to build these proactive relationships with our kids. Um, but that being said, we're far from perfect. Mm -hmm. So just before Richard Brooks was killed, we had convened, we had heeded the call from President Obama to take a look at our use of force policies. We met maybe the day before he was killed, um, but you know it gave a sense of urgency to the work that was already there, but really purpose and urgency. So we've gotten 33 recommendations and we're continuing to move forward with that work. We'd already begun closing down our jail, doing some real work on criminal justice reform. We have eliminated cash bail bonds. We closed our, our um, jail to ICE. We had done so much work, but there's so much more to be done. We talked about affordable housing in the city. We're already 300 million into a $1 billion goal on affordable housing. 20,000 units, we're already close to 5,000 in, but it's still not enough. And that's what we are seeing in our streets. People are tired of waiting. Right. They, nobody has patience anymore. So that's the challenge that I have as a leader, and I think leaders have across this country. There are things that are going to take us longer. We're, we're filling in the blanks for 400 years. So it's going to take a little time, but there's still things that we got to deliver just like this to our communities. And that's the urgency um, and the sense of purpose that, I, that I've taken out of this summer. What support do cities need to make progress like that possible? Like the progress that you want to see in your city? What do you need? We need support from the highest level of mm -hmm. office in this land. And I, and I wasn't mayor uh, during the Obama Biden administration, but I hear in the good old days, you could pick up the phone and you could call the White House. And if you had challenges with your police department, there was somebody from the Justice Department who would come in and, and help you reframe your policies. Um, in, in the good old days, even if you weren't uh, aligned with, with the same party, you could still pick up the phone and call the White House and get some assistance when your communities were struggling and you needed help. That, that's the leadership we need. I spend so much time thinking about things that I shouldn't have to think about as a mayor. Mm. I shouldn't be managing my uh, a, a, a pandemic response for my state which you know in a lot of ways i'm having to do that because i'm having to stand in the gap for failed policies from this governor and from uh the white house so while i'm, I'm managing <laughs> a pandemic response the pandemic that probably could have been contained had there been better decisions made months ago um, you're also dealing with criminal justice reform, and I can't call the Justice Department and get some assistance with that. We got to figure it out. So many things that we're figuring out on our own. What we need is leadership, real leadership. What role could the state of Georgia play in the presidential election in November? And to what extent do you think the outcome of how the state votes will hinge on residents' ability to easily and safely cast their ballots? I was so happy to go and cast my vote uh, this past week during our uh, runoff at State Farm Arena, which is owned by the city of Atlanta. It's where the Atlanta Hawks play. And in response to the debacle of the June primary, uh, Coach Pierce and the Hawks as an organization said, we want to do something meaningful. We want to be a part of some solutions in this city. So they, they challenged us uh, to adhere to the eight can't wait, which we, we've done that. They also said, we're going to put our money where our mouth is, open up our arena so that people don't have to stand in line 
for eight hours to try and cast a vote. Those are the type things that, where we have private folk stepping up saying, I want to be a part of the solution. How can I do it? This is what we've been thinking about. So I, we've got to continue to do that. Um, but also what I've been saying to people, we can't leave it up to thin margins either. Votes will be suppressed in November. We saw them suppressed in June. Mm -hmm. So we don't have a friend in the Secretary of State's office. We don't have a friend in the governor's office. But what we do have is the power to exercise our right to vote and turn it up in numbers in such a way that there's not going to be any question when all of the votes are counted and it's all said and done. I was recently cleaning out my office and I, I found some paperwork where I was a, a voter protection attorney in 08 in South Carolina mm -hmm. uh, during um, President Obama and Vice President Biden's election. Those are the type of things we're going to need in November. We're going to need uh, election attorneys at precincts available to answer questions and, and help weed through um, the mess that's likely to be before us in November. Absolutely. Mayor Bottoms, thank you so much for your time. I cannot tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation, and I look forward to seeing what you continue to do down there in Georgia. Oh, thank you. And thank you for having me. I've enjoyed the conversation as well.